pleasure to welcome you to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, my name is Stuart Munro. I'm a scientific director of ECRR, but I, I'm also standing in for the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who's unfortunately unable to be with us tonight. So he, he sends his apologies. Anyway, this is the ECRR Peter Wilson lecture, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome uh, Bunny here today, who is uh, Peter Wilson's uh, wife. And, uh, it's, and her family as well. So uh, that's a real pleasure. Peter was a, was a man who actually made a big impact on the whole of Scottish science, in particular related to rural science. He was the professor of agriculture and rural economy, but he thought out the box. He, he thought of pooling before pooling was ever invented, you know, and he was able to, in a light-handed sort of way, to bring together all those who were engaged in rural research out at the bush to be able to collaborate together. And of course, that grew, and it grew, and it grew. And ERCC is now an organisation that extends across the, the length and breadth of Scotland, and we owe a great deal to, to Peter for his vision in those days that actually brought together many of us who were actually concerned with the rural research issues. So tonight is not just a, a lecture that actually looks at some of the, the key things that are facing society today, but is a, a celebration of what Peter Wilson has, has left, his legacy, which is still going on today, and if I've got anything to do with it, will go on for a good long time in the future. So let's be thankful for Peter today. The Edinburgh Consortium for Rural Research tries to to actually address some topical issues. And perhaps there is no more topical issue than the issue that we have got tonight. Tonight, it's about food sustainability, food security. One can't make an omelette without cracking eggs. I thought that was a really nice title. Thank you very much, Tim, for that. You know, it, it really gets to the heart of the problem in a way that I think engage, will engage each and every one of us. The talk tonight is going to be given by Tim Lang, who's Professor of Food Policy at the City University in London. Uh, he, he's got widespread interests. The last time I was in touch with him was shortly after John Beddington's uh, much-vaunted uh, foresight document came out, and he was giving talks to all the media, left, right and centre, about this, and I dare say he will touch on that particular issue tonight. He's been involved in all sorts of things, including the, uh, the Chatham House Food Supply in the 21st Century Working Party. So we've got someone here tonight who's got a real insight into one of the, the major issues that's facing society at the present moment. Before we came in here, he said, don't say much about it, just, just let's get on with it. So I'm going to allow him to get on with it. So can you welcome Tim Lang? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for that very nice welcome. And thank you to the family of uh, Peter Wilson. Um, and it's a great honour, genuinely a great honour to be here. I thought long and hard about this when uh, originally being asked to do it. And it's something, this whole area about where, where this whole issue, where is the food system going, um, troubles me. I've spent my entire working life uh, really dealing with this in all sorts of ways. Um, and yet, this notion of food security is something that I think helps pull it together, uh, but also makes different demands of what we think about our food. So, I have prepared a whole lot of slides <coughs> Um, but because I spent a fair slice of my life at one point working in polytechnics, I always put up the first slide that says everything, so uh, you can then go to sleep. <laughs> so I'm assuming you read while I talk. Essentially, it's nothing new. I'm going to take you back. And I should have said I'm a social scientist. I should have said I'm a social scientist. And even worse, my doctorate was in psychology. And I, one of my treasured possessions, which I gave to the British Library, which is archiving, 
uh, well, not me particularly, but the sort of food world I come from, um, is a, a memo that was leaked to me from the farming world which said, this man is only a psychologist, <laughs> um, which I loved. I think they regretted it, actually. Anyway, we'll come to that. Are you still reading? That was a test to see if you're still reading. You've got to listen to me and read. Um, basically, I'll summarize that in best polytechnic way, we're in a mess. That's it. And there are different ways of charting our way out of it. And I, although I'm in front of you wearing a suit and a professor, and I hope evidence-based, I do my best, I think there is a real problem of politics with a small p, not party politics, although we've got that too. There's just timid, are you fourth to bottom bullet point? Mm -hmm. Policy engagement is timid. And I don't see us cracking this omelette or cracking the eggs to make the omelette or omeletting the cracks unless we get the politicians to think broader than they're doing at the moment. So I want you to bear that in mind. And part of the problem, the, heart, the big message I have, is I think while a lot of good thinking is going on about production of food for the future, next to no thinking is going on about shifting demand. And the assumption is that how we eat, the West, is ideal, when in fact it's not. So my very sober conclusion is that I think the enormity of the analysis that almost everyone now has, which is that we've got big trouble coming, uh, I can't see the politicians leading us out of it. In which case, what will? And you'll see I end up with not omelettes, but Macmillan. Events, dear boy, events. OK, we now start. Why are we even talking about this? Well, when trying to map up this lecture, I thought there'll be people here who know an awful lot and more about it than I do in parts. But I'm a generalist. I look at my team at uh, City, or my colleagues and I, we're generalists. We look right across food supply chains, developed countries, more than developing. We look upstream, downstream, doesn't matter what analogy you look. But in the last five years, there's been a flurry of major reviews, major. And they all broadly, you read it? Uh, they all broadly point to this. And I have not seen a report which actually does it as neatly as this. I am not blowing my own trumpet. This is just the way we think in our team. Actually, it's the conjuncture of that that is the problem. But then think you're a politician. Think you're a minister of agriculture. You have one here, sort of. Uh, in London, we have just an environmental and rural affairs secretary of state. Go to Brussels and we have agriculture separate from environment, separate from consumer stroke health, you get the point. We have policy fragmentation. You can have these slides, by the way, so they're, they're yours. If anyone wants them, just send me an email and I'll send them back. The difficulty is there are specialists, some in this room and the, the overflow outside, who will tell you, unless we deal with biodiversity, we are done for. And there are others who will say, unless we produce so much more, I know of one incredibly eminent professor who said blitzkrieg biodiversity. Unless we have some modern version of the Haber-Bosch uh, process to create unbelievable amounts of fertilizers in ways we don't know how yet to do, uh, there won't be any biodiversity. So we might as well get rid of it in order to maximize land use for food production. You have very different, I kid you not, I will tell you afterwards in a glass of wine, but not in public, who this man's name is. Uh, but I assure you, he said it. 
in front of the head of English nature and her jaw dropped deeper than mine. And yet, I want to end up with saying about the bottom right, I think we are, most of those reports, those, ended up ignoring health. They mostly saw health as just something that's tweaked later, or you nudge consumers to do some big change. And they don't do what I think the great architects teach us to do, which is to build it at the heart of food systems. Those reports, and others, have a common sense of urgency, which I think is great. For someone like me who's been thinking about this for a long time, as many of you have, it's great to have these august reports saying we're doomed and less. For me, it was a great pleasure to be at the Foresight report launch a couple of weeks ago and to see Tory secretaries of state saying this is very important. But they thought it was important about foreign, you know, over there, out there. For those in the antechamber, I'm waving my arms. Not Britain, not us. It's their problem. I don't think it's their problem at all. Well, it is. Actually, it's us who are over-consuming as though there are 2.8 planets or the Americans eating a diet as though there are five planets. Actually, we're the problem. But they have problems too. Are you reading? Reading these reports, I'm beginning with my colleagues to get a sense of where the shared urgency is but where they're weaker, and the number one point they're weaker on is labor. It is almost a disembodied, personless system of food production which is being articulated. The assumption is endless urbanization, not potentially a rebirth of labor on the land. And why I say that, and I actually have worked on the land, it's hard work, it's fairly brutal. Um, but the one advantage of having people on the land over replacing them by technology is the energy issue. And there are some fundamental issues that I think are raised about dignified labour and absent labour that we are not addressing. They're not addressing consumers and consumption. I don't think they're addressing how to fuse health and ecology. And as was said at the launch of the foresight, they are silent about the really the elephant in the room in food, which is all the power in food has nothing to do with either consumers or farmers, but actually is in the intermediaries, the traders, the retailers, and so on. You can read this at your leisure, but if you're interested, if you then start looking at the solutions that these reports offer, they come up with different scenarii, different emphases. I'll give you one second to read it. That's the sort of stuff I'm interested in. <laughs> this is already getting complex. At this point, preparing this, I thought, I've already lost them. They're already asleep, remembering vaguely the first slide that I've given you. But I ask you to think about the politicians. And the politicians want simple messages. Famously, they have attention spans of three minutes. It's unfair. In my experience, they're usually extremely intelligent, and some of them are very good. But they mostly want to focus in food on those three points, prices, availability, and above all, political damage not being on their watch. So we have a classic policy problem. You've got a gap between evidence and policy. Now, those of you who speak Cochrane, anyone from the medical world, we know that surgery is to be evidence-based. The difficulty is that language has been transferred through into the policy world, and I can assure you it's nonsense. The world of policy is replete with policies with no evidence, with partial evidence, with distorted evidence, and lots of policies waited for because there's so much evidence. So you've got evidence with no policy. So the relationship between evidence and policy is much more tricky in the real world than it is in the ideal and very necessary world of medicine.
But the big issue is that bottom line. Most political attention is short term, whereas in fact the problem is long term. And let's start looking at this. For those of you in the room next door, look at, I'm looking at the, the left hand slide. This is literally the latest. Uh, well, it's eight days old now. Um, this is across the bottom, is January to December. Uh, and you'll see the blue line, am I getting it right? Yes, blue line, 2007, food prices. This is the FAO's, the Food and Agriculture Organization's World Food Price Index. And you can see it's rising 2007. It uh, rocketed in 2008 and then went down. And the Chatham House report that I was on the working party for three years put together, by the way, by one of the only ministries in the UK which does have long-term interests, you'll never guess, the Ministry of Defence. Uh, uh, they couldn't, we couldn't get other ministries to show any interest in this in 2005, but the Ministry of Defence did. And they led it, actually. Uh, uh, when we were looking at this in 2006, we said, well, prices could go up because of what we call the new fundamentals. I'll come back to that in a moment. And we thought it was just going to be probably most likely that the prices would just carry on going up. Remember, they've come down for about 70 years. Our lifetimes have been dropping food prices. Uh, and we ended up arguing there's a blip. It'll Most likely is a blip that you'll get a, a rise and then a drop. And the mainstream economists said that's what will happen because if prices are high, there'll be incentive to farmers worldwide to grow more. And indeed they did. Take wheat, I'm not showing you, but take my word for it. Wheat plantings went up, wheat production went up. But then look at 2009. Here it was right down from 2008, and then it starts rising again. And then in 2010, <coughs> It rocketed almost to the top level of 2008. And do you see at the top left, the red? It's now higher than it's ever been. This is not what was expected. And it's different for different commodities. That's the one-year figures of 2010 over on the right. It varies. We're aggregating a lot. Now, what is going on? Crudely, in this one slide, uh, a lot is going on that goes back to that complicated slide I had of health, environment, but it's an urbanization and the poor countries getting richer and demanding more and more people, that complicated story. But here in Britain, what got eventually the attention of the state in 2007 was this combination of factors coming together. The evidence about climate change, soil, water, had all been there for a long time. It was seen as, you know, interesting but boffin stuff in, uh, in ministries. The issue that cracked it on the back burner was the second bullet down, the lorry strike of 2000, which shook politicians rigid. Why? Because the food system was five days from closure. 1,000 lorries blockading motorways brings this country's food system to a halt. You've all gone rather quiet. Uh, one minister told me five days. Uh, then in the Chatham House working party, uh, we were told actually not true, it was three days. And the simple thing is that the logistics revolution of the food system of the last 30 years, those blips that you get when you go through a supermarket. You think, isn't that clever? It's totting up your bill. It's not. It's reordering. It's the entire logistics revolution. It's computerized satellites in the sky. It's astonishing. It is brilliant. Uh, but it's so taut, anything can shake it. Uh, but yet, the Ministry of Defense, another bit, organized Cranfield to do a, a study, DEFRA, sorry, organized uh, uh, Cranfield to do a study that said, look, it's okay if Al-Qaeda bombs, you know, a few regional distribution centers, because there's no storage, by the way. 
It's all on the motorway. Uh, it, it's okay. They're so flexible they can adapt. It's sort of ecosystems. They even use biological language. Um, but what they didn't get in these studies was what if the system's failure? If there's not just one regional distribution center on the M6 taken out, maybe even another one taken out at the same time, but what if there's an oil price spike when one quarter of all the wagons on British roads are food? Did you know that? And half of them are empty. That's where your storage is. It's on the motorway after you've blipped. So this was getting tricky. And in the meantime, health was causing lots of problems, rising obesity, this huge externalized cost of a food system. We're living longer over the last 50 years. It's a fantastic success story. Don't let's forget it. It's fantastic. But now we're dying prematurely because of food in an unnecessary way and being costly. I was on the chief scientist's foresight obesity task force where we calculated, which is held true, that on current trends alone, and at the last working party fortnight ago we confirmed this, uh, the obesity costs to England and Wales, you're out of it, but I can assure you you're worse, uh, of obesity to the NHS is 50 billion pounds by 2050. That's a lot of money, by the way. And that's just obesity. It's not coronary heart disease, it's not diabetes, it's not strokes. It's just obesity. Okay, now, what's going on? How are we doing? Essentially, a model of production is in strain. I've put it here as three phases. Essentially, 1930s science, I'll show you some photos shortly, said, look, we don't have to accept the Dust Bowl of the 1930s and the 20s. We don't have to accept what happened with recession. We don't have to have hunger when farmers are out of business. And essentially a model of food policy was put in that we call productionism, productionist policy paradigm. And I've summarized it in bold under phase one. Essentially it was science with capital, as long as you get the distribution right, can increase food production, which will bring down prices, which is a good thing because it makes food affordable. Remember the problem is underconsumption, which is progress. And basically, that was the model that was rolled out from the 40s. It was 1920s and 30s science, heavily influenced here, heavily in Scotland. I will show you who in a moment. And by the mid-60s and 70s, it was in trouble. But saved by the bell, by the Green Revolution, and it's trouble, it's that that's in trouble again now. Uh, and there are very strong voices saying we can save it again by increasing production again. And that's what I'm questioning. I think we probably will need to increase production or do production differently, but the point is producing what? In what quantities and in what mix? That's where I'm going to end. But I want to remind you, all of this complexity is building up while governments are timid, institutions are fragmented, we've joined Europe, Europe's become very big by now, by the 70s, 1970s, and competition rules are being made easier, giant corporations are emerging, not just in food manufacturing, where they were already existing by the 1900s. Unilever, remember, was founded in the 19th century, Nestle in the mid-19th century. But by the mid to second half of the 20th century, we have fantastically powerful retailers and traders. Cargill, one company that now controls 80% of all the world's grain trade, one company, is a private company and completely unaccountable. Let's get formal. What do we mean by food security? I spend a certain amount of time in the FAO uh, I'm on a working party about biodiversity and uh, food security at the moment, believe it or not. 
it's usually, in FAO speak, food security is available, the three A's, availability, access, and affordability. Or if you can read the, the, the long quote I've put there while I'm talking, you know, it's all there, situation we exists, all people, everything, it's all motherhood and apple pie, great, it's lovely, I think it's very important, but it doesn't say anything about the environment or sustainability. Food security is still framed as being a problem of underconsumption. True, there may be 1.2 billion people overweight and obese in the world, only a billion suffering hunger, but it's the juxtaposition of those two that is now the reality, and which is showing the failure of productionism. Just having more food is not meeting social needs. So I'm a radical on food security. And the problem I, as a social scientist, have with food security is it means lots of different things. I may show you the formal definitions, but actually surrounding it are lots of complicated, articulated terms, which I've put in italics on the left-hand side. And these are important. So food security is looking a bit like I, as a psychologist, would have called a Rorschach test. It is whatever you want it to be. See the ink blot, read it, and it tells you more about you than about the ink blot. <coughs> but it goes from hard to soft. We can talk about rationing implicitly, or we can talk about capacities. A good food system, one which gives security, is one which has adaptability and flexibility, as in biological systems. There are models like this, the excellent Arnie Oshaug, a very lovely professor of nutrition in uh, uh, Norway with, uh, in fact, Lawrence Haddad, uh, uh, one of the members of the Chief Scientist Foresight report that came out a fortnight ago. You know, here, although they're talking about food security, very much in the three A's terms, those are those boxes there for the room next door, it's the middle row of boxes, but because they're smart people, they were saying on the one hand nutrition, but we've also got to have it ecologically sustainable. The problem is when it comes to the political classes, the ecological sustainability gets lost. It's all about prices and is Tesco full? I put this in to remind myself, but I've said it already, the food system is already failing on its own terms. If we just judge food security as being about production, it's already failing. And the prognosis for these sort of maps get very, very sober indeed because of climate change, water, etc. The whole of the middle of the earth starts shedding people and food capacities further north. Scotland gains, actually. This, by the way, I said some pictures. You probably didn't expect me to put up Karl Marx. Actually, the man who is really the important one is the man in the middle, Malthus. Essentially, we are unraveling food security as a Malthusian problem. The legacy, particularly we have in Britain, is, as he articulated, a capacity to increase food production, which is there, science and capital. He was talking about it in 1796-8. But it's held back by the capacity of humans to breed and the, the classical Malthusian problem that populations grow geometrically, food capacities only increase arithmetically. Marx, why well, I put him here, pop, I like the alliterism alliteration of three M's. Marx was a great fan of uh, Malthus. The reason we have a census is because of Malthus. Uh, every 10 years. Marx said he'd, he was utterly brilliant, but completely wrong. Because it was capitalism, Marx said, that held back the productive capacity to increase more to keep up with population. Uh, and in a sense, that's where you see what happened to Soviet agriculture and Vavilov and everything. For those few people who are smiling, an extraordinary push on genetics, which of course is the other M at the far right. 
he's really the legacy man, Mendel. And in a sense, those three were played out but exemplified, in a sense, by these two. These are all symbolic. Bennett Laws, who founded Rothamsted, very wealthy industrialist, founded his own research station uh, in Hertfordshire, still going. Uh, and von Liebig, not quite as wealthy, but politically more influential in Germany, uh, Austria, uh, of the old empire. But essentially, they were friends but rivals, and they said, look, chemistry will resolve this. We treat the soil as blotting paper, and we pour in nutrients, and we'll make plants grow. It was brilliant. But the people, you forgot that I said a Scott. There he is. Which is the doctor? You're right, it's the one smoking. <laughs> That's the great Boydor. I have a photo of him on my desk uh, uh, at home uh, uh, and at work. I mean, he's really the architect of productionism. Uh, uh, an Abedonian doctor founded the Rowett uh, with industrial wealth, uh, not his, but someone else's, uh, and became the first director general of VFAO. Essentially, these... These three symbolize it. Stapledon, the man on the right, in the marvelous suit. Uh, soil scientists are aborist with, said, look, if we can make the Welsh hills grow different grasses, we can change nature by applying chemistry and biology under the soil, drainage, you know. Half the world wants more water. We tend to have a problem of too much. And the butter won't melt in our mouth is probably in the middle. Uh, is probably the most ruthless person there. An utterly lovely woman. I, I'm joking. But she's the architect, really, of, of rationing in the Second World War. And these three, in a sense, symbolize the legacy of going back to them. And Boydor et al., really, we owe everything to, because they were utter visionaries, but I think we need to now question the limitations of productionism. And I think all the reports I showed you at the beginning are still locked into a Boydor view of the world, that the problem is production. No one is engaging adequately yet with consumption. And no one is engaging adequately with health, bringing health into the supply chain as a core driver. Let's press on. I think the clash we now face is sustainable development or sustainable intensification. Do we have food security just for us, as a man in the Treasury in London said to me, we don't need farmers, we're rich, we can buy food on open markets, I quote. Uh, or do we take a view that land everywhere is to be treasured and nurtured and seen as a foundation not just of health but of our civilization. Do we focus on production or do we look at whole food supply chains? And the tricky one is the one at the bottom. I cannot see how we can build a sustainable food system for 9 billion people because we haven't even got it for 7 billion people, that's today, unless we consume less to allow others to consume more. And the test case I want to give you is of horticulture in a moment. I'll skip that. Now, I've been talking about the food system. Forgive me this graph, this graphic. Essentially, a modern food system is input, it's in the middle. For those of you in the antechamber, I'm looking down the middle. Imagine it, that it goes from input through to production, to uh, consumption. The phases of the food system are discrete. They build on across the top in blue. There are environmental givens, land, water, biodiversity. There are social influences that we draw on in the food system, wanting things from it. And it's all shaped by economic drivers. And the whole food system, the supply chain, has outcomes, waste, energy, 
health, ill health, social impacts, cultural impacts, all of which are fed back in a permanent loop, but they are shaped on the left by institutions. And they are affected entirely by what my colleagues and I call shaping forces. This gets very complicated. Now, when I, the Foresight Obesity report that I was on for the chief scientists, we ended up with a huge and complicated systems map. Anyone who's seen that report? Has anyone seen that report? You're all looking blank. It's wonderful. It's a spaghetti model. You just think this is a complete joke because it's all so complicated. But that is the reality. It is complicated. So we have to think in terms of a food system. Now, why are policymakers seemingly unable to grapple with the food system's unsustainability? The short answer is it's complex. It is complex. You can't blame them for thinking. It's difficult. But some think there isn't a problem at all. That the determinants don't exist. And you're actually now getting a very subtle and very good argument. N notably, I've just read last week a wonderful long essay about to come out from Mike Hume, the great climatologist, saying, look, even though he spends his life working on climate, too much is being reduced to climate change. It's not the only factor. The problem is putting social factors alongside climate change factors. At the moment, policymakers are almost being sold an argument that everything is about climate change. Unless you sort this out, minister, we are doomed. Not true, actually. Not true. We can adapt. We can do all sorts of things. It all depends whether we get consumers to change what they do. So it's choice editing, or do we just assume they can do what they like? Do we behave like Americans, or do we grow up? <laughs> Even conventional... Half my family are Americans, I should confess. But they're not listening. <laughs> or they're not in the room. <laughs> Even conventional economists are now saying we are in trouble. You don't need to look at this too detailed, but basically the OECD, the right-wing think tank in Brussels, in, in Paris, is concluding that food prices are going to be very tricky. They think they're going to be lower than they were in the 2000s, in this coming decade, the present decade, but they're going to be much higher than 1950s and 40s. Behind it is this. This is a nasty graphic, but I like it. The middle ring is 1950s, sorry, 1980s. Then it moves out. You start 30 years ago, and we're at the present in the outer circle. It's saying, where do we get our food? From which groups of foods? And what you notice is that meat, this is the amber color, the ginger color for you in the next, uh, in the antechamber, grows from the 1980s uh, as not small, but it just about doubles by um, uh, uh, 2050. And you think, well, that doesn't matter. It's not very big. That's not a very big change. But the problem is that the way we're rearing our meat, 50% of all the cereals is fed to them. So the land use of the meat and dairy production is astronomic. It's not Scottish style having some Aberdeen Angus on a hill eating thriftily. It's treating your cows as royalty and just throwing them on the hill occasionally. It's a different way of farming. I'm an ex-hill farmer. In other words, the animals are rivals to us instead of helping us. I'll miss this. Now, in Britain, let's get more British. In Britain, we've got problems here of waste, Health, unsustainable diets, logistics of problems, prices rising. Most of our food, actually just about, just over half, is grown here. That's astonishing. 
You mean we're the fifth richest planet, a country on the planet, and we don't even grow our own food? Now, this is a historical legacy. The government's position, the British government's position, is it doesn't matter, it's very spread. There's no risk. 7% coming from Netherlands or Spain. But the Spain one interests me particularly because it's where a vast amount of our horticulture comes from. And in public health terms, we want to shift away from meat and dairy to having more plant-based. We're only producing, I'll show you in a moment, we're only producing uh, about... 50% of the vegetables that we consume in this country. And we're only producing 10% of the fruit that we consume in this country. And both of those should double. That's not a very helpful one, but it basically shows you the imports rising. Look at the dark red going across from 1988 to a year ago. 2009, basically homegrown production in vegetables is dropping, imports are rising. In fruit, look at the rise, the astronomic rise of imports, which you can look at by the drop. But in fact, a little bit of a rise under the last government of horticulture from the blue. These all show the same things. If you look at these slides later, these, I love these sort of things. These are getting to my favorite sort of spaghetti status. Lots of lines. Um, across 1985 to 2009, you see a collapse in uh, dessert apples, the top. You see one of the only things that's grown is cider apples. This is the rise of cheap cider. Big incentive there. And actually, in strawberries, where's strawberries? Strawberries dropping and then going back up. That's loss of plastic greenhouses in Shropshire. Is this ecological production? Don't know, but you can get English strawberries, <laughs> English strawberries, not Scottish, nine months a year. Uh, this is lots more. You can look at it. Always over the top. Now, where are we going? There are lots of statements on food policy, on food security. But I put here, this is from a report that uh, we did. Actually, you have to go back to 1947 to see the sort of big change that I'm implicitly, but now explicitly, saying I think we've got to do. In 1947, the Agriculture Act reversed the repeal of the Corn Laws 100 years later, uh, 100 years ago. Before that, sorry. I think we need something as big thinking as that. We need an, a sustainable food act. Something to say the only basis for the food system is to be low carbon and healthy. Something that dramatically changes the direction and the temperature. Instead of which we've had dribble, dribble. I can do it very politely, but I won't. This is where I think we've begun to get a recognition of the enormity. It's here, 2008. Here's the cover, front cover on the right of the Food Matters report. This was the first report since the Second World War which did a systems look at the British food system, and it was UK-wide. UK, not just British. And it said, we have to dramatically change. And I can tell you, because I was an advisor to that, there was blood flowing down Whitehall about that before it came to, well, what do we do about it? And that taught me a lot. That's why I'm here, actually. <coughs> because essentially the British state didn't want to engage. And it was torn between the power of Tesco et al., manufacturers et al, who said, business as usual. A tweak here, we can sell low carbon crisps, but we don't want to really check which Walkers does. But we don't really want to change the system. We don't want to 
have a 50-year plan to shift entirely. And reluctantly, the British state began to engage. It was difficult. They didn't want to, but there was pressure building up. Chief scientists were really important here in Scotland and elsewhere, Wales too. But that's just taken a step back. For me, the bad news about the election was that the new government is dominated by a cuts agenda and all the ministries are weeding out staff, getting rid of advisory bodies. I declare an interest. I'm a commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission. It's been abolished. The Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, abolished. So just at the moment when reluctant beginnings of engagement was emerging for the UK state, a very significant player for the EU, we're actually backing off. And the same has happened in the Netherlands, and the same has happened in Sweden which makes me very nervous. I accept that the policy coherence is not helped by some contradictory messages. Arguments about the price spike being affected by speculation, it was in effect, said the World Bank. No, it wasn't, said the OECD, one month apart. Have we got peak oil? Is it going to have an impact upon food? It's not yet, says the IEA. An industry task force says, actually, we may be there already. And interestingly, WikiLeaks, that well-known evidence base, <laughs> uh, one of the most interesting leaks for people like me was the US diplomats saying the Saudis are not able to produce enough oil to maintain prices as low as they are. And if you follow oil prices, which I do, they're actually very high. So. We're suspecting that things are not good. The thing that paradoxically makes me very pleased is that the food companies, the big food companies, are now seriously worried because they want to be around in 50 years' time. I said nice things about the Ministry of Defence. I never, ever want to say anything nice about Nestle in public, but even Nestle recognises Coca-Cola, Tesco, Unilever that it's in their interest to have sustainable agriculture. PepsiCo last year in the UK and Northern Europe made a commitment to lower its water footprint. I mean, Pepsi, the best thing it could do would be to stop selling Pepsi, actually. Uh, but uh, I don't think they'll do that. I always tell them every time they stupidly invite me to a consultation meeting. I don't know. <laughs> I do not know why they do, but they keep doing it. I think they have masochistic tendencies. Uh, but it makes me feel better too. Um, uh, but they're making a commitment to lower their energy use and water use by 50% in five years. Now, this is radical stuff. You have to accept it. This is very radical. Unilever, probably when we, my, our team, we did an, an audit for the WHO on uh, which companies in the world, food companies in the world, were seriously engaging with the public health agenda as laid down by the World Health Assembly in 2003, different lecture, but very serious stuff, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, which companies were actually engaging? Unilever was really the only one which was engaging. So this is a seriously thinking company, even in my terms, critical terms. Unilever has now made a commitment last year uh, to be a completely sustainable sourcing company by 2020. Wow. I mean, can they do it? It's about their products. They're looking after their brand reputation. You know, all of those things, we can put it in brackets. But the point I'm trying to convey to you, I'm not a patsy for them. I assure you, my centre has a rule we take no money from them, any of them. But I think what I'm saying is they're looking ahead and they're seeing the same data you and I see. But governments aren't listening. That's my point. And PepsiCo wants consumers to change. It thinks it can do it by labelling. I mean, this is a joke. But it's interesting that they're daring to think. But the main problem is most of them are wanting to change without consumers knowing they're changing. 
So they're doing what Heinz baked beans did. They lowered the salt content, lowered the sugar content slowly without you noticing it. But actually, the problem with food and consumption is we're going to notice it. 35,000 items in the supermarket shelf can't go to 7,000, and we don't notice. So my view is consumption has to be brought into the policy agenda, and it's not. It's not in the food security agenda at all. But NGOs are doing that. If you're interested, lots of wonderful experimentation going on, radical, lovely stuff. Here, not far from here, you've got the wonderful Fife Diet, which I think is great. And the big indicator that's come out, as far as I can see, from the Fife Diet, I mean, one would have thought one would be clinically insane. I can say that as a psychologist, you can't. To try and eat 80% of all the diet across a year from Fife is astonishing. I think it's wonderful. But they've lost weight. Great. Exactly my point. Last week, the biggest conservation, the biggest biodiversity and conservation organization on the planet, WWF, launched a sustainable diet charter, asking people, if you're bothered about pandas and leopards, actually, you're going to need to make your diet sustainable. So they're beginning to engage with what the politicians are frightened of. I think your husband would have liked that. She nodded. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson nodded. I've said that. Now, let's wrap up. What I've painted is a very sober picture. But I'm optimistic. I want you to know this. I think, as the great man said, you can fool the people a lot of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. And I think we're waking up. This is wonderful. But in a very everyday sense, this is what my colleagues and I think there are. There are now different policy positions, which are all competing for policy space. If I was to analyze, and I'm about to start doing it, doing what I did in the 1980s, asking Dear parliamentary questions, sorry, I can't ask them, but you get friendly MPs to ask them. Has the minister met representatives from the food industry? How many times, sorry, how many times has the minister met people from the food industry in the last year? What we're already finding is there's a lot of revolving doors going on with some people from the food industry. I speak as an advisor to Department of Health, I am troubled by the responsibility deals where Kellogg seems to have an enormous influence. I speak very carefully. Have you read them? Essentially, I suppose what I'm saying is solutions I think that are really sustainable are going to be in this bottom end. There's a tussle, I think, between Sustainable intensification, which the chief scientist and the foresight report has gone for, or whole system change. I go for that. The Sustainable Development Commission went for whole system change. Said, if you really want food security, this was our report on food security, the only way to have a secure food system is to make it sustainable. And that requires consumers to change, production to change, distribution to change, in fact, everything to change. And that sounds dangerous, radical stuff. Well, it will be if we wait till a crisis. But it's perfectly doable over 30 or 40 years. Where to now? I have been arguing this. I've been arguing, essentially, this is a more complicated version of that four part I put up, that a secure food system has to deal with all of these. And at the moment, it's trading off gains in one for losses in the other. What we need is an omni-standards approach, something that integrates the totality. Each of these has a good evidence base. It is stupid to ignore any of these for favoring the others. 
It's taken 60 to 70 years, the Boydor productionist paradigm, to build this. I think we can plan for 30 to 40 years. One of my disappointments in the Foresight Report, replete with wonderful data though it is, the Foresight Food and Farming Report that came out a fortnight ago, was I thought it was incredibly weak about institutions. It said nothing about who's going to do this. Because unless you've got people who are going to do it, unless you've got champions, unless you've got institutional structures which facilitate that, you won't get anything, anything vaguely like this. The last government reluctantly set up a food policy council. I was on it. Had food industry people, non-food industry people like me on it. It was beginning to gel and get it. That's why we got the Food 2030 report their final statement, abolished. The thing that upset me was something you weren't even aware was created, which was the Cabinet Food Committee. From the last four years, for the first time since the Second World War, we had a Cabinet subcommittee dealing with food. It had a wonderful acronym, DAF, Domestic Affairs Brackets Food Committee. That's the sort of title of a committee I like. A real wonky one. Chaired by the Secretary of State. It was English, but had subcommittees going to Scotland and Wales. We had, for the first time, the beginnings of something that was getting interesting. Right, let's end with these. I have been arguing, I think, a process of shifting from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We've got to, I think... Stop just thinking how to increase output for current diets, moving to the right, to what do human bodies, I'm not meaning institutions, what does my body, your body need, and how could farming or horticulture grow it? We've got to stop thinking how to mine resources, phosphate, oil, fertilizers, for food, but how can we build production on ecological principles? How, we've got to stop driving food policy as a pursuit of ever lower prices to saying, how can we reflect the full costs of production? There's not. No one's paying for the motorway. You and I are, actually. The atmospheric pollution is not being paid for. Yet the entire logistic system of the last, brilliant though it is, of the last 60 years, is an externalised cost. So, what I want is instead of having nutrition guidelines that say eat two portions of fish a week, which is what I'll say, of which every report I look at my colleague from the SDC, every report that I've done from the Sustainable Development Commission for five years, I have said I am unhappy until the Food Standards Agency removes that advice because where are these fish coming from? If you want to give nutritional advice, you've got to think about the source of the nutrients. Where are they coming from? Where are the omega-3s and omega-6s coming from? Seaweed or fish? If you want seaweed, well, make out your eco-nutrition guideline. Well, that will be interesting, wouldn't it? Let the British eat f seaweed. <laughs> Have you been reading? Everything changes once you say you've got to integrate all of these things together and translate it to the absolute practicality, it means reducing meat, probably only eating grass-fed meat, or heavily grass-fed meat. It means you think very carefully about coffee and tea. These are imperialist legacies. It means you have to think very carefully about where you're going to get your fruit from. There's more carbon getting the fruit to me to be virtuous and eating my three portions which I do on my porridge every day, every morning, as only a Scottish-educated mother could have made me, <laughs> he says, smiling. How am I going to get that when horticulture in Britain now only produces 10% of the fruit that the British consume? This is absolute folly as a land use policy. So everything changes. <coughs> Everything, that's the last slide. Everything changes. 
So I've given you a very short, and forgive me for the intensity that I've thrown at you, I don't think this is impossible to understand. I think these lovely reports that I began with, that I've tried to play fair with and draw on with respect, I think they show a complex picture, but I think they're missing a trick. They assume how we eat is up to us. I don't think it is, actually. It assumes UK discourse is normal. I think the second bullet from the bottom is critical. If you've got nothing else from this, I urge you, you who have an election in Scotland, your last government, the present government you've got, has tentatively tiptoed into this area, but then backed away from it. The interests of alcohol industry and biscuit industry, I speak as someone who chaired the review of the Scottish Diet Action Plan for your government. This is about power. So we have a choice. We either build broad movements calling for ecological food production, or we await for events. Dear boy, events. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think Tim has laid down some real challenges. This audience consists of uh, minds that have uh, engaged in a whole variety of different sciences in, in Scotland. I'm sure there are a, a number of questions which are just lurking there to come up. Rules of engagement. Rule of engagement number one, keep your questions short, please. Rule of engagement number two, hang fire until the young lady with the microphone comes so that we can all see. Rule of engagement number three, those of you next door, we're waving, yes, uh -huh. uh, if you want to question, you're not distracted at all, come through and give your question as well. We, we don't want two societies here. So uh, any, who's going to kick off with the first question? Rule number five is I... I give short answers. He also gives short answers. Sorry, across there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think one of the fundamental problems is how do you change attitude? People assume that somehow living is about having rather than being. How on earth do you get them to focus on totally different things? It's a matter of getting people to survive and realize survival is the only answer, not having and consuming and so on at all. How do we relearn how to contrive to survive and get that message across to everybody? There's no other way. A communication issue, Tim. I think it's more than that. I suppose what I was hinting at was that it's about what do we conceive of as progress? And there's a big debate, uh, as we know. Actually, I think one of the good things that is happening is this debate about why is a sense of well-being not growing as we've got richer. It sounds very hair-shirtish. I sit in a suit in a lovely building. You know, why, could, why should we not have a decent standard of living? But the point that we now are beginning to recognize is the hard data about happiness and well-being, not following from everlasting growth of material wealth. And you in Glasgow have one of the widest income disparities uh, within the UK. And we in Britain now have Victorian gaps of health inequalities, but a much higher base. This is a very complicated agenda. It's the agenda Michael Marmot's International uh, WHO, UN, Commission on Social Determinants of Health got into. And the, in fact, much more interesting is the Marmot Review done for the last government, but still built in and accepted by the the new government. I think there is the beginnings of a policy debate about exactly what you're saying. But what it's not doing is connecting with 
reshaping the economy. So you've got a fissure between an intellectual debate and the hard levers of the economy. And I don't see any way of that happening unless social movements pick up and run with it. It's too esoteric at the moment. It's not, it's hovering on the edge of, I think, going mainstream. I, I mean, I'm aware, I, my colleagues and I work very closely with the NGO world. Civil society is really seriously engaging with this, but they too are slightly frightened because it means questioning their own membership base. So it's tricky. Other questions? That was nothing about food, but food fits into it. Back at the right-hand side there. Admittedly, what I'm going to ask is about food production, but in the Scottish context, both government and food producers are very focused on the reform of the CAP, which is due to be implemented in January 2014. If one's trying to put some of what you want to happen into effect, are there any elements that should be built into that reform? Um, I, at one point, actually, almost went into a reverie when talking to you about the EU. You probably noticed on two slides I had EU stuff, um, but I didn't go into it, so thank you for asking the question. The short answer is almost everything about production policy that we do in this country is shaped by the cap, as you probably know. As a long-term cap watcher, maybe you are too, and certainly there are people in the room who are, um, cap never, ever stops moving. It's like a slow amoeba. Um, and cap is going through a very interesting phase at the moment. It's split from subsidizing production, which personally I was in favor of, uh, for reasons which I can explain later over a glass of wine to anyone. But it has severed the, dis the connection between us, the taxpayer, and keeping farmers going. And instead is now paying farmers for pillar two, not pillar one, in cap speak. So environmental goods. Exactly at the moment, where if you follow the analysis that I've been sharing with you, which is in all of these reports, not just me, I assure you, you would want environmental goods to be built into the heart of production. So CAP is no longer encouraging farmers to produce ecologically, but is instead, I'll put it in daily mirror or daily record terms, you have ecology at the edge of your farm or the edge of the field, not in the field. It seems to me what we have, that's like saying health is something that's left to the surgeons to correct your indulgences. What we've got to do is build cap around a sustainable food system. And I've been giving a series of papers in Brussels, in DG Agri and elsewhere, DG Senko, arguing the position that we at the Sustainable Development Commission mapped out which was that we want CAP over the next 20 years, 30 years, to shift from being CAP to being a common sustainable food policy. It sounds trite to say that, but everything I've been talking about tonight demands that. Unless you want to go for the definition of food security, which is food nationalism, top of my list, I saw you looking at it, Stuart. Uh, you, you, you want to have food crossing borders. In which case, some common notion of sustainability as your food system has to be in your policies. In which case, it has to be CAP. CAP needs to stop and become or evolve into a common sustainable food policy. And slowly, there are little signs of that happening. I've sat on a working party on horticulture and brokered by DG Sanko. DG Agri is now funding fruit schemes for schools. It's nothing compared to the 40% that goes direct to farming for other reasons. But it's beginning to show in Brussels some capacity to integrate. But it's not big enough. I had the pleasure of knowing Sikho Mansolt at one point in my life. 
He was the man who founded the common agricultural policy, for those who don't know it. Uh, and when I used to talk to him, two or three times I met him, I'd say, you know, what, what should we do? He said, I had no idea it was going to become this, this monster. He spent the last 20 years of his life campaigning against it. And I think we need to bear all of that in mind, from cap to a common sustainable food policy. That's what we've got to do. You know that, that figure where I put up the six blocks, health, environment, governance, etc. I presented that at, to the Director General of DG Agri, and they went away saying, hmm, they won't see it, but in 20 years we could see it. That's what we should aim for. Okay, there's a question down at the front here, and also one across there. Oh, we've got a lot of stuff that are coming now. You're asking big questions. Sorry, just there. Does that answer your point? Earlier, yes. Um, you are actually speaking in Scotland, and Scotland is rather different from England in terms of its agriculture and food production, strikingly differently so. And, you know, what I tend to get the message is a lot of, his, of what you're talking about seems to be directed against the intensive farming, which is much more common in England. And what I'm not hearing is, in fact, the recognition of what has been traditional over generations of hill farming in Scotland, which is 85% of agriculture in Scotland. Um, and that sustainability, which has been there for generations, is actually being undermined by an overzealous environmental uh, lobby, which simply doesn't seem to understand actually the huge advantages which have been in instilled in generations of farming in Scotland. And because of the imbalance between the environmental aspects uh, so, in a stakeholders meeting, a, a farmer's interest would be outnumbered several fold by environmentalists <laughs> who seem to have little understanding of actually how farming works. And as a result of that, Scotland is actually losing a lot of its inherent quality farming uh, because of the, the warped nature of the CAP the uncertainty of it continuing in this way, uh, and be completely overwhelmed by rules and legislations of what actually are petty environmental schemes, as opposed to maintaining the basic structure of what our predecessors did achieve in integrating movement from the highlands to the lowlands to up and down, grass-fed, and really, we could actually, as a farmer in Persia myself, could increase our production while looking after the environment, if only we were allowed to do so. I think right? you're answering your own question. Actually, yeah. You are, you are. No, I, I thought you answered your own question. The only thing I would say is that I take the point, I'm an ex-hill farmer in Lancashire, which is not Scotland, but I think I know a little bit of what you're getting at. Um, I think two points, land prices, access to land is an absolute block. We haven't got a way of allowing young people to come in. It's still based around family farms as opposed to a fluid entry system. And I think the debate that is now happening under the present government around skills and the skills and capacity building for the labor force of a dwindled farming is, I think, a very interesting one. Um, I'll, I could say a lot more, but I won't. The second point is, uh, you coming from Perthshire, um, you're in the part where under all, almost all climate change scenario, the fruit growing capacity of Perthshire is going to grow rather than diminish. And uh, I the SDC in, Scotland, in, in Wales has actually been instrumental in helping encourage and rebuild um, a commitment by the Welsh Assembly Government, which has been very good, I, sh I should have said it in my talk, um, to support 
a rebuilding, long-term rebuilding of horticulture. So don't just think farming, think growing. Growing and plants, a good diet is plant-based. I, th I think we've got time for just one more question. Uh, there was one across there that came up earlier on. And then we moved to next door. <laughs> well, they, they haven't come forward yet. They're still there. They're Are you still there? there? Do you want me to come in? I'll come in there. <laughs> everyone else goes, I'll do another round over there. Uh, thank you. It's actually, um, I guess, continuing on from what you've just said. I mean, you've talked about state as actors and, and um, retailers in between producers and consumers, but is there not any way of um, a, a role there for the kind of small scale, the individuals, the households, communities, actually growing one's own, um, you know, in kind of small scale uh, growing and, and urban agriculture? I'm a fan of urban agriculture because I think it's a way of energising people. Let me be very clear. Uh, Kathmandu is the only city that I know that feeds about 40%, but one of my colleagues has been working in Kathmandu, uh, mainly because his wife is there, um, and I can assure you it's not Edinburgh. Uh, you look at Kathmandu and it's sort of bits of housing speckled across fields. So one thinks of it, it's basically the city is designed in a different way. It's grown in a very haphazard way. So urban agriculture is something which I think means, a bit like food security, means different things in different places. But I think it's symbolically incredibly important to encourage, in say Britain, a highly urbanized society for people to learn growing skills, I think is really important. Um, I think that's the real value of gardeners, actually. We don't talk enough in food policy about gardeners. Ministers start giggling if you raise gardeners with them. But there are nine million gardeners and only 380,000 farmers in the UK, you know, who are more important in terms of building connections culturally I'm talking mass psychology. I'm not talking about main production. You're not going to get main production from urban agriculture in Britain. Don't even fantasize about it. But we can use it as a way of engaging with the food culture. That, I think, is important. Uh, and we hosted a symposium on skills, food skills, at my university, my oh, Centre for Food Policy, and had people from the Skills Councils, BBSRC, you know, top dogs, alongside this urban movement. And essentially what came from that was something that I did not expect, which is there was a possibility over 20, 30 years of people learning and engaging in urban circumstances and moving to rural work. And that's what we haven't sorted out. We haven't sorted out actually a medieval problem, which is living in a village but working out. Part of the drift away from the land worldwide, not just in Britain, has been living in the countryside is not nice. The young are attracted to go to cities. How are we going to deal with that? If you want a skills-based, good horticulture that doesn't rely upon Ukrainian labor, living in caravans, which is where one of my colleagues has been working with Brussels sprout pickers for a research project, we've got to engage with that. We've got to work out dignified labor on the land. It may sound very odd, It'll come if there's a war. It'll come overnight. So I think we should think about it now. <laughs>